η ξενιτιά το χαιρέτε τζίβα ερήμου το μοσχό Σιγανά και τα πεινά, σιγανά, σιγανά, σιγανά και τα πεινά. Αχ, εγώ ήμουν που το έστει. Σιγανά, σιγανά, σιγανά και τα πεινά, σιγανά, σιγανά, σιγανά πατώ στη γη. On behalf of everyone at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, we want to welcome you this evening to our gala celebration. We have a truly exciting evening planned for you tonight. We begin now with our cocktail hour. You know, I have to say, one of the most remarkable experience I have personally had at the American School is being able to tour the Athenian Agora and other parts of Greece for that matter with Professor John Camp. John, who is our director of the Athenian Agora excavations, possesses a truly remarkable understanding of ancient Greece. I mean, he should. He's been excavating there for over 50 years. But what makes John special is how he tells the story. Now, I've toured quite a few historic sites with John, and each time we walk the ruins and he explains things to us. And we get to imagine what it must have looked like back then. But tonight, we have a different experience in store for you. And we don't have to imagine anything. In fact, we can take you there. Dr. John Camp, together with Dr. Stephanie Ann Ruata, historian at Ubisoft Quebec, will lead us now on a journey of ancient Greece through Assassin's Creed Odyssey, a video game featuring a virtual world that was created using, amongst others, research that was conducted at the American School. So let's go. Hello, Taxidi. Hello, and welcome to Ubisoft Quebec Studio. I'm Stefaniana Huata, historian on Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Ancient Greece Discovery Tour. Released in 2018, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a large-scale video game created by a multi-studio team led by the Ubisoft Quebec development team. With more than three years of crafting and development, this open-world role-playing game, which takes place in ancient Greece at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, allows every player to create their own unique adventure. Choosing ancient Greece at the height of its glory permitted to highlight such a pivotal moment for Western civilization. While this was a crucial moment in history who deeply impacted the foundation of our civilization with the development of democracy, medicine, philosophy, theater, art and architecture. It also marked the end of the Greek Golden Age to a major conflict that destabilized the ancient Greek world, the Peloponnesian War. This war, which was punctuated by common and personal interest, confronted two distinct sides. The Delian League with the Aegean cities under the patronage of Athens and its maritime power, and the Peloponnesian League, 
which included many cities of the continent and depended on the Spartan leadership and their military ground forces. In this historical context, the game offers the choice to play Cassandra or Alexios, sibling mercenary of Spartan origin as they embark on an epic journey. As players travel through a war-torn Greece world on their trireme looking for their lost family, the story echoes the themes of our ancestor love for tragedy and comedy. Along the way, you will meet and discuss with famous historical figures such as Pericles, Aspasia, Herodotus, Phidias, Brasidas, and of course, the great Socrates, but also engage with many enemies ranging from Spartan Oplite and Athenian Strategoi. As your story unfolds, the game becomes more than just entertainment. It allows the player to discover the iconic characteristic of the ancient Greek world with its varied landscape, architectural and cultural wonders, historic cities and inhabitants, a true journey in ancient Greek golden age. With the desire and goal of offering a gaming experience grounded in history, an historical research was undertaken during more than three years. The scientific work made by the American School of Classical Studies of Athens, in addition to museum database, antique authors, result of experimental archaeologic projects, articles, scientific book, as well as multiple inscriptions and varied documents of the different archaeological schools in Greece, have constituted our documentary sources. They support the interest in realism and historical credibility developed at the heart of the game and help to guide the various team of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. This research guided the different physical, economical, architectural and societal dimension of the game. Ancient writers such as Aristophanes, Sophocles, Herodotus, Thucydides and Pausanias among others were specially consulted. Reports and plans from archaeological school allow the team to recreate some monuments and position them into this virtual world. The scientific research and the contribution of experimental archaeology as well provided several answers to many questions raised by the reconstruction of cities and the activity which took place in antiquity. For example, to reproduce the activity of the marble workers of Athens, we rely on the research of the American School of Classical Studies of Athens, which demonstrated that generation of marble workers had settled near and around the Agora. This historical research was integrated into different structures of the game and followed specific convention of game logic. To create the best gaming experience and to allow the game system and mechanics to function correctly, object placement, street width, climbable guidance on building, dynamic of crowd, and non-playable character, as well as object size, monument and terrain, to name a few, had to be adapted, since they need to obey strict metric for the automation of the world to run smoothly. Some consistent codes are even more important for a gameplay perspective, as for example, the consistency for color, feature uniformity, decoration, and material stylization to fit into game console memory, or even the space between columns for a temple that need a minimal width to allow combat behavior. This is where the art of making games impose its own canvas on history. But today, no combat, only the pleasure to discover the most incredible site of ancient Greece in Assassin's Creed Odyssey with Dr. John Kemp. All right, we are now down at the Eridanus River, where we're meeting the people who are going to come with me through the Agora. In the background, you can see the Acropolis lying to our southeast, and we're crossing the bridge over the Eridanus River and about to enter the Agora itself. We're on a gravel street, which despite its modest appearance, was the main street of Athens, known as the Panathenaic Way, because the procession in honor of Athena during her festival, the Panathenaea, came 
from the city gates through the Agora, right where we're standing now, and up to the Acropolis. So this is the main street of Athens from the main city gate through the main square up to the principal sanctuary of the city. And we're walking along it. The Greeks, unlike the Romans, did not pave most of their streets. So you're seeing just the packed gravel uh, that made up the surface of this road, which runs right through the Agora Square, which is on our right, but at the moment it's market day and it's full of stalls and booths and is set up uh, for commercial activity. On other days, those temporary booths that we're looking at now would not have been there, and it, the area could have been used for big public meetings, for elections, uh, for military drill, for religious processions coming through, theatrical performances. Uh, it was multifunctional, and the Athenians came down to visit the Agora pretty much every day, but for a variety of different reasons. We're seeing now on the screen, or in front of us, uh, a, what we call in Greek architecture a stoa, which is any colonnaded building. And this one was bigger than is shown here. Uh, it would have had 23 of those Doric columns across the front, and altogether would have been a little over 50 yards long, 150 feet long. But otherwise, this is how the building would have looked, including the painting that you see above the columns. Uh, and this was uh, one of the most public buildings in Athens because it was built for no specific function. Anybody could use this building for a variety of purposes. Most of the other buildings we're going to be seeing uh, had a specific function, a specific group of magistrates who carried out the city's business. But this building was built and used as a hangout. And as soon as it was built, uh, the inside, where we can go in now, uh, would have been decorated with beautiful uh, paintings uh, described for us in ancient sources and said to have been done by the best artist of classical Athens. In probability, they would not have been murals of the type we see here. These are good renditions. Uh, borrowed from Greek vase painting, but the originals that went here in about 450, 430 BC uh, would have been done on wooden panels, and they could have been, and indeed in the 4th century AD, they could have been removed from the building and taken away. So we're never going to see the paintings. They disappeared a long time ago, but the building is like the world's first public art gallery. If you think about it, there's plenty of good art before this, but it's in the royal tombs, uh, it's in the king's palace, uh, it's in the holy of holy of the temples, uh, and not everybody got to see it. But here you have a building where you can see you, you can't even close this building. There's colonnades, uh, there are no doors, you can't shut this building down, and it's facing right on the public square of Athens. So here is art which everybody uh, was intended to enjoy just by coming in on a hot summer day and being in the cool shade behind the, below the columns uh, and these paintings uh, to enjoy it. There's a back wall, a door shown here, and that we don't have evidence for because we have not yet finished excavating this building and we do not know what the full length of the back wall looked like. But if we go out that back wall, door, uh, we're still in the area of the Agora, and we're going to go back around uh, and have a look at more of that. Those paintings on the outside wall that we're seeing here on the right uh, probably uh, were not there in antiquity. All the paintings were on wooden panels, and they were inside the building. The building was also used as a memorial uh, for military triumphs, and when they captured uh, enemy weapons, the Athenians would actually attach it to this building here, and the descriptions of many of the paintings also concern uh, military triumphs by the Athenians, both historical ones and ones that we think of as mythological. Theseus fighting the Amazons, uh, and the very famous painting, the most famous painting of antiquity, uh, the Battle of Marathon. And now we're going across, we will leave the painted stoa as it is known, and look at some of the other buildings in the Agora Square. Uh, we'll continue up 
uh, the Panathenaic Way. And again, uh, a lot of the activity you're seeing here, these temporary booths, would have been set up every week, every 10 days to have a proper market day. Uh, as is a tradition pretty much throughout all the cities of Europe. Uh, and here we're entering what is the physical center of ancient Athens. This is the altar of the 12 gods. Uh, we have pieces of it. Uh, we excavated it. Much of it lies underneath modern railroad tracks today. Uh, but we also have excellent literary sources that tell us that this was established in 522-521 BC as the physical center of Athens. It was the zero milestone. It's described when Herodotus wants to give us a distance in Egypt. He says it is as far from Heliopolis to the sea as it is from the altar of the 12 gods in Athens to Olympia. And we have an inscribed milestone that says, I'm a milestone set up to tell you that it is uh, six miles from this, the altar of the 12 gods to the harbor. So it is regarded that right now, physically, there are other, other, other events, militarily and religiously, there can be other centers, but this was regarded as the physical center of ancient Athens and was one of the very few permanent uh, ancient monuments that were allowed to be set up within the open square. And all that we're seeing now would be put up and taken down in a single day uh, on a fairly regular basis. And you're seeing the commodities, a huge range of commodities that would have been uh, for sale in the Agora on these market days. And we have numerous descriptions and lists of the sorts of things uh, that could be found. You can see pottery, you can see vegetables, you could probably see animals and slaves uh, and uh, uh, pretty much everything you needed in ancient society would be on sale here and is described for us in the ancient sources and we often find uh, some of the remnants of some of the workshops where these uh, items were produced. So we're just strolling through the market on a Saturday afternoon up here on the left, you can see some armed warriors standing on a big statue base. Originally, there would have been 10 statues up there, each one a hero after whom one of the 10 tribes of Athens was named. The Athenians were organized politically into tribes, and these are the eponymous heroes, the tribes were named after these uh, mythological heroes, and statues were set up uh, in the Agora, and on the base uh, below each statue, uh, it was like the base of the, the statues was a public notice board, and you would find hung up there a series of white paneled, uh, wooden panels on which had been written in charcoal information concerning members of that tribe, military conscriptions, public honors, events uh, involving the law courts, all your rights and privileges, uh, the announcement would be made if you were supposed to come out and fight in the army and you were going to be in your tribal contingent, you would find a list of all the people from your tribe uh, who were supposed to show up for military duty uh, for that particular campaign. So it is in the days before radio and television, telephones and newspapers, it is where public information was first disseminated. You would go into the Agora, you would read the news, and then you would share and discuss it with your fellow citizens. And again, it's known as the eponymous heroes because they gave their names to the 10 tribes. We're continuing now westward, and you can see now coming up in front of us, slightly left, a round building. And this is known, the Greek word for that, a tholos. This was known as the tholos. The porch on the left is an addition. The building itself, as you can see, is round. Uh, here, it has been embellished uh, in ways that we can't uh, define. We're not sure of at all. This is this part is, is somewhat made up. The paintings on the outer wall and those engaged columns uh, are not attested in anything we found yet. Uh, this was the public dining hall for the executive committee of the Senate. There would have been, it was used 
uh, for dining because they were fed at public expense. During the month, they served as the executive committee, and it was done in rotation. Uh, and they were fed at public expense in this building. In addition to that, one-third of a tribal contingent, and each tribe contributed 50 men to make up the 500 men who sat in the Senate, and they served as head of the committee uh, in tribal rotation. Uh, and during their month in office, they were fed in this building, and one-third of that contingent, at least 17 of them, were expected to sleep in the building. So this is essentially where 24 hours a day you would find 17 uh, citizens serving as senators uh, on duty in this building, ready to deal with any crisis uh, that might arise unexpectedly. So this is where the democracy uh, sleeps, uh, but is where it can be found. Uh, round buildings are unusual in Greek architecture. They're difficult to understand. They're hard to roof. And the tholos is known for the uh, quality and the complexity of its roof. You can see it's made up of terracotta or baked clay tiles. Uh, they are all diamond shaped and they overlap each other coming down the roof pretty much like the scales of a fish. But what is interesting uh, is that as you come up the roof, uh, and there are drawings that we can see from our archives, uh, you can see uh, that the tiles are going to change shape because the circumference of the building decreases as you go up the roof. So you have almost square tiles at the bottom there, at the lower right, and as you go higher up the roof, right to the pinnacle, you can see the tiles are the same length, but they're a much, much uh, smaller width. And so when we find a tile, from the angles uh, that can be measured, we know where it fits on the roof. And the reason you see that uh, cap up on the top there is because we have tiles uh, taking us a certain number of rows, uh, actual physical tiles surviving, up to that point, but we have no surviving tiles from the last three or four rows, and we're not even sure whether it had a cap like this uh, or a canvas that was stretched over it or whether that was open to the sky like an eye, an oculus, which allowed light and air into the building. So there you're seeing some of the complexity uh, of Athenian architecture in roofing uh, this very uh, central building. It's right next to the Buluterian, which is the building adjacent just to the north. Uh, and there you're seeing uh, its porch and entranceway into it. Uh, and this is where the Senate of the 500 would have met and held office and deliberated uh, for the Athenian people to vote on various issues. So we're walking into the building now. It's a little ornate as we see it here, but the windows are usually found in buildings of this type. The seating is arranged in a series of rectilinear uh, seats, as you can see. There would have been a somewhat higher speaker's platform uh, pretty much in the middle of the building, so we could be seen and heard by 500 people. Uh, and this is where uh, the Athenians, again, the Senate would have been allotted, not elected, and it only served, each board served for only a, a single year. But for 500 years, the senators would sit here, 50 from each of the 10 tribes, and in tribal contingents, they would uh, serve as the executive committee headquartered in the Tholos right next door. So this represents uh, the again, the heart of the Athenian democracy and the first stage in the legislative process. From here, every 10 days, uh, all the Athenian citizens would meet uh, at a nearby meeting place known as the Pnyx, and they would either approve or vote down the legislation uh, that was uh, proposed by the Senate. Uh, and the monument of the eponymous heroes would have been used as well because you could not pass a law uh, unless uh, its proposal as, as created by the Senate had been posted at the eponymous heroes for at least three days before the next meeting of all the people. So this is, we're really in the heart uh, of the world's first democracy uh, when we look at the Tholos, the eponymous heroes, and the Buluterian. From here, we're going to go 
uh, a little south and then go west up a major ramp or staircase, which does not survive well today. Uh, but up at the top is one of the best preserved ancient monuments of all antiquity, let alone Athens. It is a temple dedicated to Athena and to Hephaestus, the god of the forge and the goddess of arts and crafts, appropriately enough overlooking uh, this great center of commercial activity uh, and uh, industrial work by all Athenians or many Athenians. So you're seeing here the building, again, uh, a little more colorful and a little more adorned with, with peripheral objects like those tripods and like the rings around the columns. But basically you're seeing the standard form of a fully developed Greek temple made in this case in the Doric order, where there are no bases to the columns and where the capitals are very, very simple, as you can see, just flaring out to create a larger uh, bearing space for all the superstructure uh, of the building. The painting that you see right there may be a little bit more, but up above it, uh, the, the sculptures are correct, though here they're shown in bronze. Uh, and we have still in place on the building the original marble uh, sculptures of that frieze. So it gives you a nice idea because a lot of color and paint was used in the upper parts of a Greek temple. Uh, here in the pediment, this triangular area, there were a big mythological scene would be shown. Uh, here too, the figures would have been uh, of marble. We have a few fragments that we can assign to it, but we know there was a scene because we have their footprints uh, on that horizontal part of the triangular area. So we have the traces of sculpture uh, which adorn this building. And this building, uh, just preceding the Parthenon in terms of its date, uh, is the best preserved uh, ancient building that we have. Uh, in Athens. And here we're going into the building itself, into the cella. The purpose of a temple is to serve as a safe box uh, for valuable votive offerings to the gods, and primarily as a place to house the statues of the gods, usually toward the back of this room here, which is known as the cella. There would have been a large bronze statue of Hephaestus, and next to it, an equally large statue of Athena. Uh, there is no evidence that we have uh, for how the paintings might have adorned the interior of this building, uh, if it did, uh, nor how many statues we might want to put inside. But here you're seeing one of the two bronze statues that would have been part of the interior decoration. The paintwork up on the ceiling and all that uh, is attested. They were very beautifully painted, these buildings particularly for temples in their upper parts, from the level of the capitals of the columns uh, up to the ceiling. Uh, for the rest, that paving on the floor, those are likely to be later additions. In the 5th century BC, uh, if they were floored at all, it would be a simple pavement of marble. And in the Hellenistic and Roman times, later periods, uh, you get the use of mosaics and brightly colored marbles decorating the temples of the gods. As we come out here, uh, we get a nice view of the relationship of the great public square right at the foot of Athens' most famous, most important sanctuary, uh, the Acropolis, uh, dedicated mostly to the patron deity of Athens, uh, Athena. We're now approaching ancient Delphi from the south, and it's appropriate that an eagle is guiding us because that is how Zeus determined that Delphi was the center of the world. They weren't sure where it was, so at dawn on the same day, he sent one eagle flying from the western end of the world and one from the eastern end, and they flew all day until they met over Delphi. And even today, you can still see eagles coasting along the cliffs above the site. Delphi is in many ways the most important site in all of Greece. It was a sanctuary and it was dedicated to Apollo uh, who could help you tell the future and the most infallible oracle of the ancient world was here at Delphi. 
The other thing that is interesting about Delphi, other than the fact that everybody came here to learn the future, uh, is the fact that the Greeks basically didn't think of themselves as Greeks. They thought of themselves as residents and citizens of an individual city. If you met an ancient Greek and said, where are you from? He wouldn't say Greece. He would say Sparta or Athens or Corinth or something like that. And each individual city-state was highly independent. Uh, and when you look at the archaeology, the style of the architecture, the style of the sculpture, the alphabet, the calendar, the weight systems, will all be different from city to city. They were not a unified people. And the only counterbalance to that is Olympia with its games every four years, and even more so, the sanctuary here at Delphi, uh, where uh, the sanctuary is actually not run by the city that controls the territory around it, which is ancient focus, but it was controlled by a committee uh, made up of representatives from the 12 neighboring city-states. And this is the only really international sanctuary the Greeks had. The result of that is that when the Greeks wanted to impress their neighbors, there's no point in putting up a big statue in your own town. Uh, it's much better to put it up at Delphi, where all the other members of the city-states will see it when they come to the festival and to consult the oracle. Uh, and this is where you can show off uh, against, uh, as opposed to, uh, your uh, the other neighboring city-states. And so you find at Delphi, it's a great receptacle of thank offerings dedicated to Apollo, the god of light and Iraq oracles and music, uh, but it's also the place where the Greeks uh, stored, if you will, or displayed their very best art. So it's an extraordinarily uh, important place to the Greeks politically, socially, artistically, and cultural. And what we're going to do in a minute is land just outside the sanctuary and walk up the sacred way looking at some of the principal monuments. And here we're now down at ground level and we're just outside. There's the sanctuary wall with one of the six gateways that led into the sanctuary. And this one is the main entrance. And along it, we're going to step as soon as we go through that gateway uh, onto the sacred way, which will lead us up to the temple of Apollo. So as you come in, you can see both sides of this street are lined with statues mostly bronze statues, and they are dedications of different city-states. Uh, there's monuments by the Athenians celebrating the Battle of Marathon. There are Spartan monuments celebrating victory over the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, there's a big silver bull there, which was paid for uh, when one of the city-states had a huge catch of tuna fish and made a huge amount of money from all these fish and dedicated one-tenth of the proceeds to the sanctuary here at Delphi with a silver bull in honor of Apollo. And as we go up the sacred way, we're going to see statues of these different types, and we're going to see these little buildings which at first glance look like temples, but they are technically known as treasuries because inside them were kept dedications from one single city-state and private dedications by the city, by the citizens of that state. So everyone represents a different Greek city and its dedications to the god Apollo. So here you're seeing one set up uh, by the people of Sicyon, which was right next to Corinth in antiquity and was a very rich and powerful city-state early on and very influential. Some of the best sculptors and painters of Greece came from Sicyon. And this is one of the earliest of the treasuries. And you can see they're just like miniature temples de uh, decorated with large amounts of sculpture and perhaps occasionally with painting, though that doesn't survive so well. But pieces of these uh, beautiful little buildings. And so they're small, but they're absolute gems of architecture and particularly elegantly decorated with their sculptures. So again, this is, this is what sets Delphi apart uh, culturally and artistically. 
The next one, as we come up the Sacred Way, is dedicated by the island of Sifnos. And the Sifnians, it's here on the left. You're just beginning to see it, I think. And the people of Sifnos had gold and silver mines. It's a tiny little poor island. Uh, and with one-tenth of the proceeds from these mines, uh, they set up this little gem of a building, as you'll see when we go around the corner, uh, with the columns, not as architectural columns, but in the form of these maidens known as caryatids. And again, the sculptural decoration that has been found in, in the museum at Delphi is absolutely exquisite, uh, dating to about 525 BC. Soon thereafter, according to the historian Herodotus, the people of Sifnos stopped making dedications to Apollo, and because of that, uh, the god in return uh, made sure that the mines flooded and the Sifnians were deprived of their wealth uh, from these fabulously rich mines. So this is one of the, a perfect example in terms of sculpture and architecture of what a treasury looks like at Delphi. Inside, none of this survives, of course, because it will have all been plundered in antiquity, but there would be all sorts of dedications made both by the Sifnian people as a whole and by individual citizens, warriors, mercenaries, uh, successful businessmen who made their own dedications as a thank offering to Apollo for their good fortune. And altogether, uh, there are several dozen of these treasuries representing most of the great city-states of Greece. The one right in front of us is Thebes uh, and the uh, Boeotians, uh, which is the area between Delphi and Athens. As we go up here where you see those warriors, they are standing in front of another treasury that is very well preserved and has actually been reconstructed, and that is the treasury set up by the Athenians as a thank offering uh, for their victory over the Persians in 490 BC. Uh, and you can see the kinds of inscriptions that were set in front of it. If one went up really close, uh, one could see inscriptions all across the wall of the building as well of different types, recording uh, sacred uh, emissaries coming to Delphi to consult the oracle, a manumission of slaves, even some hymns uh, to Apollo. And here on the Sacred Way, we're going up farther beyond the Athenian treasury, where we can see the Buluterian, a meeting place for people responsible uh, for running the sanctuary. And it looks like uh, very much like a small version uh, of the one at Athens uh, with uh, rectilinear banks of seats uh, around three sides of the building where the representatives could sit and listen to the speaker, who would be uh, probably uh, speaking at a raised platform, a speaker's platform, somewhere not far from that table in the middle there. But otherwise, this is based on how other Buluterian look like, because this building is not well preserved today. But this is what a Buluterian usually looks like, a meeting place. And we continue on up the Sacred Way. We will pass more treasuries as we begin to get to the area near the Temple of Apollo. And there are a variety of dedications made up here. On the right is the treasury of the Corinthians. And here we have, on the left, across the street from the Corinthians, a stoa, which was dedicated by the Athenians uh, to celebrate victories over various Peloponnesians. Uh, and you can see the columns are widely spaced because the purpose of this stoa is just to pro provide protection for a series of military trophies taken from enemies and set up in the building or attached to the back wall of the building. And there you can see the prow of a ship, for instance, which was captured in a sea battle against the Peloponnesians. And there would have been a whole series of other dedications of armor and the like uh, attached to the back wall. So it's a, an Athenian military monument, probably of the middle years, first half of the 5th century BC, designed to thank Apollo for any help he may have given in their victory over the Peloponnesians. As we go around the corner here, we're coming up in front of the temple, and some of the most impressive of the dedications 
up the stairs here, uh, particularly on the right, where there was a uh, statue of a chariot given, a man in a four-horse chariot, given by the people of Rhodes. And in addition, you can see in the background there on the right, these uh, coiling bronze snakes that stand about 20 feet high, that sort of green weathered look. If you go around to the right here, follow the young man, you'll see uh, that there's a great big statue, but behind it uh, is a very interesting and important monument. It's three snakes coiling up, uh, and their heads at the top of their coils support a golden tripod, a very rich and elaborate dedication. And this was made on behalf of all the Greeks for their victory, the final victory of the, of the Persian Wars, uh, in a battle that took place at Plataea in 479 BC. And what is nice, it stood there, that golden tripod, for, for centuries. Eventually, it was taken by Constantine to adorn his new capital city, Constantinople, in 330 after Christ. And if you visit modern-day Istanbul today, you can still see uh, two-thirds of the height of those coiling snakes. Uh, down at the bottom, they carry the names of the 31 city-states that fought against the Persians. And one of the heads of the snakes uh, can still be seen in the Istanbul Museum. So this is an important historical monument uh, that has survived for us uh, since 479 BC, albeit with a major move uh, from Delphi to Constantinople in the 4th century AD. You can see here the Temple of Apollo across the way, a nice view in the sunshine. Uh, it's a Doric temple. It has a long, long history. We're told there were six versions of this temple. Uh, the earliest ones uh, made of feathers, another made of wax, a third one made of bronze, and then three stone temples. And this is the last of the stone temples sitting right on the foundations and ruins of the earlier versions. There was a 7th century stone temple and a 6th century stone temple. And then this one here, which dates to about 330 BC and was paid for by money contributed from all the Greek city-states. It has the usual six columns across the front, and then it has 16 down the long side. It's longer than most Greek temples because it has extra room inside. And if we go into the building, we'll be able to see uh, the arrangement made because this was an oracular shrine. So you, the visitor would go in to the temple proper here. There'll be internal decorations, which are very good guesses as what it might have looked like, though we have very little surviving above the foundations of the building. But as we go to the back and see the cult statue, which is certainly the visual focal point of the uh, temple, we find that there's room behind the statue. And it's back there behind that fence and down some stairs in chambers underneath that the Pythia, who was the priestess who told the future, uh, uh, inspired by Apollo, uh, would have sat. So you could sit in the main part of the temple and hear what she was saying, but you couldn't go down where she is now, as we are doing, uh, because uh, we can and down here, the Pythia sat on one of those bronze tripods, those three-legged vessels, over a cleft in the rock. And the smoke that came out of that when she inhaled it uh, inspired her, and she would uh, begin to talk and prophesy in words that we don't really understand. Uh, but there were priests who could then uh, rearrange it and interpret it for the person making uh, the request to learn the future. And it could be very simple. It could be a man coming, wondering why his wife wasn't having children. It could be a major city state coming to say they wanted to found a colony and where should they found it all over the Mediterranean. So huge decisions and very small decisions were made down there in that chamber, which is known as the Adeton, uh, the place where you're not meant to go, which creates the length, the extra length uh, of the temple that we see when we look at it from the outside. But this is uh, a good attempt to restore how it would have looked uh, in antiquity. And then we go on outside and continue up the hill. 
uh, we will see more dedications found by the French archaeologists who started digging here uh, extensively in the 1890s. Uh, the site had been known for hundreds of years. There was a whole village on top of it, uh, and that had to be moved. Uh, and the French have excavated here for well over a century now, uh, finding these treasures. We will take a path up to the upper part of the sanctuary. And here we are making our way up the path. And the uh, festival in honor of Apollo, known as the Pythia, uh, the Pythian festival. It was characterized by uh, the athletic contests that are common to Olympia with all those same events. There are athletic contests, but in addition, because he is uh, the god of music, there were also musical contests, singing contests, and theatrical contests. So at Olympia, we find no theater uh, but here at Delphi, within the sanctuary, there is a theater that could hold several thousand people to watch the musical and theatrical and dramatic contests, which took place here whenever the festival was going on. I think it's somewhere between around 5,000 people who could be accommodated in this little theater here, which was repaired. We have an inscription about it in the second century uh, BC, but originally probably was dated to the 4th century before Christ. Farther up the hill, where we cannot get today, uh, there was a stadium for the athletic contests, which were the other part of the so-called Pythian Games. So, oh, over here, one last building we should see, because it's important. Uh, this was a clubhouse built from people uh, from southwest Turkey, which was Greek in those days, from the city of Knidos. And it's very interesting because it's of the same date and sort of serves the same purpose as the so-called painted stoa in Athens. Uh, the architecture is very close, built about 475 BC. Uh, and when you go inside, you can see it was decorated with wall paintings, which are described by our traveler Pausanias. And you can see them here uh, as reconstructed. These paintings, according to Pausanias, were done by the same artist who did the best paintings in the Painted Stoa in Athens, a man called Polygnotus, who came from the island of Thassos in northern Greece. And when you compare the architecture, which is hard to do when it's reconstructed like this, the details of the architecture, the two buildings are very close indeed in their construction. And it's not a stoa, it's just uh, it's a leski, which means the clubhouse. And it's where the people of Knidos, when they came to Delphi, uh, could uh, rest uh, and enjoy uh, the paintings that decorated this building. And perhaps it's from here that we can get a more expansive view of the site. Uh, there's our guide flying over the Temple of Apollo, as you can see it down there. Sacred Way just below it to our left, lined with these treasuries uh, from all the city-states of Greece, and down uh, farther toward the entrance that we came in by. And we are flying now uh, down the southern slopes of Mount Parnassus, which is the big mountain in the center of Greece, in the area known as Phocis. And in the distance, lower down, we can see part of the sanctuary of Athena, Pronaya, and it has treasuries, and it has uh, one temple at least, and an enigmatic round building that we can't be certain about, though it probably it's such a lavish building, you can see it right below us now, it almost certainly served as a temple as well. And this is sort of a secondary uh, sanctuary for Delphi. In some of the sources, it's called Athena Pronaios, which means Athena before the temple, referring to the fact that you would come to this sanctuary first before you came to the main sanctuary of Apollo a little bit further to the west. Welcome back. A special thank you to all of our friends at Ubisoft, Dr. Stefania Anurata and Professor John Camp for that amazing experience. Our gala celebration is set to begin in a few minutes. But before we start the program, we thought it would be good to just take a few minutes, especially for those who are new to the American School, 
so they can discover just a little bit more about us. If you're interested in mankind, if you're interested in society and how it should function, then you would do well to study the past. There are certain moments in history where the human spirit just kind of bubbles up and goes. Whether we're talking about democracy, art, philosophy, it doesn't really matter what the subject is. It begins in Greece. The school acts as a gateway to not just a different place, but sometimes a different time. We bring Greece's past to life to really help shape the world's tomorrow. Preserving, protecting, promoting all aspects of Hellenism from ancient times till today. And we've been doing it for 135 years. There were educated businessmen, lawyers, financiers who truly believed that the study of the Greek past was of a great good for the general public and that it needed to be advanced. We exist by virtue of the philanthropic efforts of individuals like them. We had pioneer women archaeologists leading research teams in Greece. We are international, multicultural, and intercontinental in terms of the networks of collaborations that are carried out. We're a consortium of almost 200 leading academic institutions in the United States, all of whom support the school. We draw from that membership, whether in Texas or Hawaii or Massachusetts or Florida, to bring people here. In a place that has you know, three world-class libraries within 100 meters. You know, when you're in Athens, it feels like the center of the universe. I would rather do this here at Athens than anywhere else because the major monuments are here and um, it's very inspiring. You feel what a contemporary Greek would have felt standing on the Acropolis with the Parthenon right next to you. What you're doing is creating the next generation. They're all going to be high school teachers. They're going to be professors. Uh, they're going to be scholars. And they are the ones who are going to pass on our understanding of antiquity. We have the pieces that were necessary for the working of the democracy. And those are the people of Athens speaking to you directly over thousands of years. We have about one and a half million items digitized. All of that information can really be disseminated to new audiences, to the global classroom. The American School gives you a place where you can kind of explore your own passions in a way. You have people who are so passionate about the material, they create tools to study it. When you see what can be done at a single site, then you realize, well, why can't we do this across all of Greece? and have all of Greece accessible in that way. There's hardly a part of Greece that some American school project is not operated in. We've got 300,000 cataloged objects to educate our students, but also for research so that we can come up with better interpretations. We're also developing ways to present this all to the public. So we're creating a management plan to create an archaeological and ecological park, and educational programs for children in the States, which we translate into Greek so that students in Greece can also use those same materials. The collection is about the history of Greek genius through the ages. It is very important to find ways in which to attract people, to make them understand that there is value in the old books and secrets that are hidden in there. Our mission is essentially a rescue mission. We're creating time capsules for future generations. It is important to be able to uh, share this through exhibitions, scholarly presentations. We carry out many synergasias, collaborative projects with archaeologists and the different inspectorates of the Ministry of Culture. We conduct research together and publish together. We're at a moment of revolutionary change in archaeological science. Using sophisticated uh, techniques, we dig deep into the past. 
we can now tell not only what a person had in his last meal, but where he lived. I guess I've always been pretty interested in different things, but the school gives you the opportunity to really explore all of those things. You come over as an American and you leave feeling much more like a Greek. You really do get a second home. To Defteros Piti. A large part of this evening's program is actually dedicated to the Gennadios Library. We think it is important for us to take just a closer look inside at this remarkable place located on our campus in Athens. They say that nothing is more difficult to predict than the past. And uh, how we view the past uh, depends on the questions that we ask. Everything that's happening now has happened before in different ways, and it's preserved here at the uh, Gennady. People knock on my office door, and they're holding one of the books. And they say, look what I found. The Gennadios Library opened its doors to the public in 1926. Many of the books are uh, rare materials uh, that were part uh, of the private collection of John Gennadios, a Greek uh, who was ambassador in London uh, in the later part of the 19th century. With the foundation of the Gennadios, it is the, the whole scope of the American school that changed, uh, that in fact it doesn't stop with the end of antiquity, as other institutions do, but it continues and strives to actually understand and study and, and gather materials for the history of Greece through the ages. The library is a place that is fascinating with uh, all the treasures that it has. We have the Byzantine manuscript that was written uh, in Asia Minor in the 1240s. The first printed edition of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, which was printed in Florence in 1488. The first printed edition of Erotokritos, uh, which is uh, a, a poem uh, and, and theatrical play that uh, was written uh, in Crete. Wonderful travelers' uh, books, French, German, British, who came uh, to Greece. We have the papers of Heinrich Schliemann, the papers of uh, George Seferis, Odysseus Elitis, but also we have expanded our modern Greek literature collection to more recent literary generations. Dimitri Metropolis, a colossal conductor on the level of Toscanini. We have his archives here at the uh, Gennadium. To see the, the history of Greece and of Hellenism preserved here the way it is, of course, it's fantastic for me as a Greek American. Uh, and I have to ask myself, how can I, what can I do to help that? We try to find funding to digitize our collections. The digital library is a world to be discovered. There are things uh, and mysteries and secrets that are hidden in there. You can teach a class in the United States and you can see live what we have here in our collections. We have lectures and symposia and exhibitions uh, that attract a wider public. And this has brought more collections and, and more materials into the library. We have opened the library to younger people. It's amazing to see young people interested in Greek history. We discover new treasures that we didn't knew existed. I think it's astonishing that the Gennadius houses the most amazing personal items in the possession of Lord Byron, a long-lasting figure for the 19th century. This combination of the most monumental, but at the same time human aspect of his life is of itself what makes Gennadios unique, but also what drives scholars and philologists in their approach to the past. They study the Greek world, which is much bigger than 
Europe and Greece. The Gennadios is the best library in the world for post-Byzantine Greek history. This is a place where I am comfortable. This is a place where people understand what I am doing. It's impossible to study the classical past without being aware of how that past was studied in the 19th century. It's impossible to move from the French Revolution to the more radical and democratic politics of the mid-century if you don't examine what happens in the support of the Greek Revolution for independence. All these questions are vital today. I think it's important that uh, Greeks and people worldwide know Makriani's contributions as an unselfish patriot who fought valiantly for the independence of Greece. The Makriani's wing, together with these beautiful grounds, will enable the Yenadios to have a dialogue with the broader community, enriching our understanding of the Hellenic world from antiquity up until the present day. Thank you for joining our virtual cocktail hour tonight. We want to express our gratitude to Ubisoft and to all of our sponsors and all of you who are joining us this evening. And now, without further ado, please welcome the chairman of the Board of Trustees, Alex Zaguareos, to begin our gala.